Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session six in our Bertelsmann Transformation Series, organized in partnership with our cousins at the Bertelsmann Stiftung in Germany. I'm Tony Silverfeld, Director of Transatlantic Relations at the Bertelsmann Foundation in Washington, and it is an honor to host today's discussion, Global Economic Uncertainty, Managing the COVID-19 Shock. The driving force behind this session is the Bertelsmann Transformation Index, which you'll hear more about in a moment. This session will provide a look at how this crisis will likely unfold economically in the months ahead. But take comfort in knowing that this session will not be all doom and gloom. We also intend to outline the array of countermeasures that can support developing countries in dealing with the combined effects of the pandemic and the economic crisis. We have lots of ground to cover in the next hour, so let me start by introducing the experts who will guide us along the way. In just a moment, you'll hear from my colleague, Halka Hartman, a senior expert at the Bertelsmann Stiftung, who will set the scene for this discussion through the lens of the Bertelsmann Transformation Index. Then we'll shift gears to hear from a longstanding member of the BTI Advisory Board and economist, Rolf Langhammer from the Kiel Institute. Rounding out today's discussion, we're privileged to be joined by one of the world's foremost economists, Carmen Reinhardt, Chief Economist at the World Bank. It's a pleasure to have you all here, and I look forward to your insights. Once we've heard from our speakers, we'd like to bring all of you into the conversation as well. So at any point, please feel free to submit a question to the panelists using the Q&A function on your Zoom toolbar. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as time will allow. So with that, I thank you again for being here, and I'd like to turn the floor over to my colleague, Hauke. Hauke, it's all yours. Thank you very, thank you very much, here, Tony. Um, when we conceptualized this online series with our Washington colleagues, we quickly came to agree that it should be dialogue oriented and it should be solution oriented and not just a presentation of the results of the transformation index BTI, because whatever positive feedback we are getting to the more than 5,000 pages of country reports that we are publishing every second year, we are very much aware that our comparative assessment of 137 developing countries is after all, a comprehensive transformation analysis. And therefore, it cannot possibly go into details to such a degree to allow for the deduction of uh, strategic advice. So for diagnosis, we are proud to work with an excellent academic network of 300 country and regional experts in more than 120 countries. But for prognosis and for political recommendations, we need to dig deeper and therefore we um, are privileged to turn to the expertise of renowned capacities in different thematic areas. And in that sense, uh, the BTI today and uh, in the other times of the series is a thematic door opener to a room for further dialogue. Today, we are certainly privileged to have in this very room Carmen Reinhardt from the World Bank as an outstanding economist and Rolf Langhammer from the Kiel Institute as a longstanding member of, the, of our advisory board of the BTI and a good friend. They will enlighten this room with their evaluation on how COVID-19 crisis will unfold economically and how governments and the international community can cushion such a massive blow. And with my own introductory remarks, I will be very brief. The results of the BTI 2020 do not tell us anything about the corona pandemic, the economic and social fallout or crisis management of governments for the very reason that um, our country reports were written, reviewed, and edited last year at a time when we could not, when nobody could foresee such a huge challenge coming. Still, the results of the BTI on economic transformation are a necessary reminder how better many economies in the developing countries had already been, how heavily indebted many states had been, and how deeply socially divided many countries were already before the pandemic. The extent to which governments uh, lack any financial leeway before the crisis then also illustrates the limited capacity for effective management in the crisis. The quality of democracy, market economy, and governance in developing and transformation countries as measured by the BTI has fallen continuously over the past decade and has reached a new low. And one reason why the last decade was a troubled one is because it brought particularly pronounced economic challenges to a large number of countries and governments. In the years following the global economic and financial crisis of 2008, the global economy gradually recovered thanks to massive 
fiscal stimulus directly after the shock and then extremely expansionary um, monetary policy conducted over the entire period. However, especially the resource rich and export oriented developing countries had to cope with the shock of the sudden and steep drop of world market prices for energy and most metals and agricultural products beginning in the fall of 2014. And I will now share some slides, hoping that this will work. Um, so as we can see when comparing the economic performance levels in the BTI 2010 and 2020, different regions were quite differently affected. The orange ones negatively, the green ones positively. Many Latin American and Southern African countries particularly were profoundly shaken by the falling world market prices for raw material exports. And in many countries of the Middle East and North Africa in turn, of course, economic and social development has been held back by civil wars, severe repression, and the massive marginalization of broad parts of the population. So in all three regions, over the course of a decade, the BTI's average economic performance score fell by about one and a half points on a 10 point scale, which to us represents quite a significant tumble. In turn, the majority of Asian economies have shown solid or even dynamic development. All in all, macroeconomic indicators deteriorated in 61 of the 128 countries surveyed since the BTI 2010, including Argentina, Brazil, Nigeria, Russia, South Africa, and Turkey. And as a result, of course, also fiscal stability suffered. While the BTI 2010 reported that 38 of all surveyed countries featured stable fiscal policies, this share fell to now 20%, so it almost halved. The countries affected are marked by the red arrows here, as you can see. Several countries are burdened by all-time high debt levels and in some cases spend well over 20% of their revenues on interest payments alone. So rapidly rising debt levels are also further restricting government's fiscal leeway with regard to improving their social security systems. And in this regard, the pressure to act has not diminished. Although poverty has been reduced worldwide in recent years, and in some cases substantially, the social divide has increased significantly in many countries. As a result, 76 of the 137 countries show extensive levels of socioeconomic inclusion, a status assessed with four points or less um, in the BTI and highlighted here in the reddish colors. Um, their entrenched patterns of exclusion, poverty, and inequality are widespread. So much for presenting some of the results of the BTI. Let me conclude by saying that um, many countries have not yet regained uh, the status of economic transformation they used to have before the global economic and financial crisis of 2008. And to sharpen our observations, this, what I just showed you, has been a pre-corona diagnosis. So now yet another downturn and on a much more massive scale is unfolding due to the economic and social consequences of the corona pandemic. And with uh, this grim stage setting, dear Tony, I pass the word back to you and do thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Hakai. I couldn't have asked for a better segue to turn the floor over to Rolf. Um, you know, we've had 10 years. It's a really disturbing picture that you paint there, Halka, and that doesn't even include the coronavirus. So, Rolf, what are we looking at now? Well, thank you very much, Tony. I will first address the problem of the current outlook. Second, the question, which regions are most affected and when will recovery return? And third, what can the international community do about that? Well, the situation so far, it says that uh, the pandemic is a terrifying combination of global demand and supply shocks, which diminishes living conditions of all people in developing countries, but to a very different extent. A huge social divide appears as the overarching threat. Both healthcare and housing conditions expose especially low-income people employed in the informal sector to the pandemic without any support from a social safety net. Third, the demand shock 
sharpens the divide between people working in leisure industries, tourism, travel, entertainment, and other consumer-oriented services, and those working in manufacturing and agriculture. In the former industries, demand has collapsed, leaving many low-skilled employment opportunities idle, while in the latter industries, demand can be sustained, admittedly at a lower level so far. The supply shock sharpens the divide between people working in global supply chains, which are now, for the time being, hopefully, only interrupted or, because of political troubles, may become subject to a revision. And those people working in domestically oriented activities with a high local content. While jobs in the former activities are threatened, jobs in the latter can be secured, again, admittedly at a lower level because of a recession at the moment. Fifth, the already existing pandemic threat of a digital divide can now already materialize even more sharply if production processes get ever more digitalized as a result of a pandemic shock, leaving those people unfamiliar with digital know-how and or are dismissed from their jobs because of the introduction of labor-saving technological innovations. Six, Support from China, as we saw it in 2008 over the uh, big financial crisis, is unlikely to work again at the same level because of an expectedly massive change in the Chinese economy towards domestic market orientation, import substitution, and self-sufficiency, as well as because of a structural change away from material, material consumption. In addition, fiscal stimulus in China is far weaker than 2008, and the political constraints, which privilege imports from the US, you know, the US-China trade deal, discriminate against imports from developing countries. Seventh, apart from threats in the real economy, developing countries have become under financial stress and therefore resorted to the international financial institutions, including the IMF and the World Bank, for help in postponing debt service. Such help is unlikely to come simply for free, as the donors will demand more fiscal discipline which again goes at the expense of expenditures targeted for support of poorer people. Now coming to the question which regions or countries are most affected and when will recovery return? Well, tentatively all countries, depending on leisure industries, in the tourist and travel industry, directly through loss of visitors are affected and indirectly because remittances from seafarers working on cruise ships will shrink. In Africa, East and South African countries will suffer more than West and Central African countries. In Asia, all tourist centers into China, Thailand, Malaysia will face losses, as well as countries producing intermediates for finished goods, which are see sensitive in rich countries and where import substitution policy will be pursued from high-tech products to pharmaceutical ingredients. In Latin America, commodity producing countries will be affected as long as demand remains dispressed. Both speed and time span of recovery is uncertain so far. Back to work, that means production, will likely to come earlier than back to play, consumption. Recovery will probably uh, follow an asymmetrical V-shaped pattern with steep decline and a relatively flat upper tail like the swoosh. But where well, Shakespeare, I would uh, cite King Lear saying, the worst is not as long as you can say this is the worst. It means people think maybe that the worst is already behind us. It reads trivial, but developing countries with high relative human capital endowment, reasonable governance structures, and a workable healthcare system will recover earlier than countries which do not enjoy such assets. The most uncertain aspect, in my view, is the demand structure of rich countries. Back to normal may not be the same as back to the old demand patterns. It is not only the case that digitalization will be high on the agenda, maybe that also consumers may fear about their jobs um, in a decade from now, and not only care about the day after the end of a pandemic. And that may fuel savings rather than consumption, and will not easily create a demand momentum for developing countries exporting to rich countries. Now, finally, what should the international community do? I think that immediate financial relief should be as generous for developing countries as the rich countries receive it from their central banks. Second, 
A standstill in protectionist measures in G20 countries should be high on the agenda of G20 summits. And finally, development cooperation should perhaps focus more in the future on improving primary healthcare systems, fighting the spread of pandemics, rather than simply investing into physical infrastructure, which has a longer gestation period, higher capital binding, and a low and a higher cluster risk. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Rolf. We, we don't often get a Shakespeare quote in the midst of economic <laughs> discussion, so thank you for, for adding that to the mix. Uh, I want to turn the floor over to Carmen now. Carmen, you and I normally are sitting in Washington, and we often hear from the White House talks of V-shaped uh, recoveries. Um, Rolf just mentioned this idea of a Nike swoosh, which I, I like, because um, it helps me visualize these things. Um, we also hear a lot of talk recently about a, a K-shaped recovery, where growing inequality is pervasive. I wonder if, sitting at the World Bank, I wonder if you could talk a bit about how you see things. Carmen, we still have you on mute. Uh, there oh, you I'm are. sorry. Um, no worries. Thank you. I, I think That's we've it. gone from from hockey to Rolf to me, from grim, grimmer, and grimmer still. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, in terms of the shape of the recovery, um, from very early on, uh, early this year, I took the view. I wrote about this in Project Syndicate. I wrote about it again more recently in Foreign Affairs that a V-shape is unlikely uh, for a variety of reasons. And many of them are very much connected to what has been discussed already, that initial conditions prior to this crisis in a lot of countries were a lot weaker than initial conditions prior the, to the 2008-2009 crisis. Um, that, you know, commodity price shocks have occurred as well. So this isn't just a COVID crisis. This is, you know, a, a double whammy. But importantly, uh, one of the things that I highlighted early on is that this crisis did not start as a financial crisis but it's morphing into a financial crisis of, in a variety of dimensions uh, already. Uh, both both Haki and, and, and Rolf have, have mentioned the issue of indebtedness in many countries. And this, this is a major source of more immediate concern uh, for the many of the low income countries. I will we, we will converse on what's being done and what can be done, but let me say that uh, a concern is that we start out with a health crisis, which has become a very serious economic crisis. India's second quarter output decline is almost 70%. You know, it, it, we're, we're on un, uncharted territory. Um, the massive needs, uh, budgetary needs to cope with the pandemic at a time of collapsing revenues, because you don't have declines in economic activity of this magnitude without taking major revenue hits. Um, you become uh, immediately, uh, very rapidly indebted. And, and, and that, that is a source of vulnerability in the more immediate uh, future for many uh, developing and emerging markets. More broadly, for, for the uh, advanced economies as well, I, when I talk about morphing, I'm also talking about financial crises, credit crunches, uh, because you, know, you don't have collapses in economic activity and employment. And this gets to the heart of your questions without full bounce back. How many of the businesses that shuttered uh, will come back? How many of those malls will survive a long period of, of being empty or semi-empty? How many of the jobs uh, will, will return? How many of the restaurants will reopen? So there are hysteresis effects. 
Uh, and, and right now, I think the financial concerns, understandably, are in a back burner to the more immediate health concerns and the output declines, the employment hit. But the deteriorating balance sheets of households, of firms, of financial institutions that lend to small and medium businesses, that lend to households, is brewing. Uh, right now, we also have it in a state of semi-suspension because there's been a lot of grace periods granted on repayment of many debts. And this is, this is not one or two countries. This is pretty much across the board. And as those payment uh, grace periods begin to uh, uh, unwind, I think we will be seeing, you know, a financial sector that is very battered, notwithstanding the very low rates. Uh, and so my concern, and this goes back to your very question, is we face a lot of headwinds uh, on the recovery side for it to be, you know, a nice V-shape. Uh, Vincent and I, my husband and I wrote in the foreign affairs piece, do not confuse rebound with recovery. A lot of things are going to look V-shaped, right? Because you took such a massive hit in the first half of the year that any kind of snapback looks pretty robust. But in effect, if you look at per capita incomes and you look at the major uh, uh, systemic crises of the past, um, re, you know, per capita incomes take on average, you know, six, seven years to climb back. And in some cases, uh, they don't, uh, not, for lo not for a long while. I mean, Greece and Italy have per capita incomes today that are below what they were in 2007. And I'm not suggesting that, that something that extreme applies on a blanket basis. I believe very much on what has been discussed here that there's going to be a lot of differentiation by country, by, you know, by region. Um, but the headwinds, I think, are also going to be quite sustained. I, I want to conclude on this, you know, very disturbing note that the World Bank is putting out very soon uh, the Poverty and Shared Prosperity Report. And the key finding, the key takeaway from that report is that for the first time since 1998, we see a big spike in global poverty and that people living in, you know, below the, the, the most extreme poverty line uh, have, you know, has jumped to, to, to you know, well over 7%, which is more than double the goal uh, so, so this is a big setback, big, big setback, and I expect that uh, the next year will be very rough waters, uh, especially for the poorest countries, but also for emerging markets as a whole, uh, with uh, more debt difficulties coming to the forefront. And as I said, the concerns about the financial the state of finance and, you know, the prospects of having another credit crunch, I think loom large, and that's not just an emerging market issue, that I think in varying degree cuts across income level. Carmen, thanks for that. Um, I, I want to encourage our audience to go ahead and start submitting questions to the Q&A function. But Carmen, I want to stay with you with an additional question just from me. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we talked about at the outset, that we weren't going to have a session that was all doom and gloom. Um, but we did, as you say, had gloom, gloomier and gloomiest. Um, but we can pivot on that right now. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about what governments and multilaterals can do um, in terms of policy to at least help mitigate the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment. Well, you know, I, I have, and, and again, this goes back to my early piece at the towards the beginning of the year when, when all of this got underway, likened the situation to the, the 1930s depression, not on the policy response, 
but on the fact that it is really global. Because if you look at 2008, 2009, it was a banking crisis in 11 advanced economies that had, you know, big ripple effects globally, to be sure, but they weren't the engulfing crisis uh, that COVID-19 is. Uh, so the policy response, unlike the 30s, uh, has been much more uh, attuned to coping with the downturn, much more counter-cyclical. Um, and that has been true in different degrees because countries face you know, varying degrees of fiscal space. Uh, but, you know, it's been true in advanced economies and it's been true in emerging markets. Uh, some emerging markets um, have seen really counter cyclical fiscal policy for the first time. Uh, and in terms of the multilateral, the IMF and the World Bank have been doing record lending. I mean, the, the, you know, over 100 countries. And, and this occurred fairly rapidly. They tend to be programs that are more fast disbursement, more fast disbursement accompanied by more front loading, understanding that the, the need is in the here and now. Um, we've already mentioned uh, fiscal policy. We mentioned multilateral, more rapid lending. Uh, I'd like to add that, you know, uh, Counter-cyclical monetary policy is hardly new to the advanced economies. We've been seeing, you know, the, 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 what we thought was unprecedented, you know, a little over 10 years ago, uh, now actually pales in comparison to the monetary policy response this time around. In, in, and, you know, uh, all kinds of, of uh, support from the central banks over and beyond conventional monetary policies in terms of guaranteeing, uh, you know, facilities that basically serve to, to support uh, corporates and, and, you know, Main Street lending in the U.S., you know, to banks and so on. But for emerging markets, it is also a first that we see, as a whole, the emergence of counter-cyclical monetary policy. Think back to the Asian crisis, the Mexican crisis of 94, 95, the Russian crisis of 98, any crisis you want in Argentina, any, you know, and the response in monetary policy has always been to tighten because you're trying to defend the currency. This time we've actually seen a lot of accommodation. Those are positive things. And they all go in the right direction. Um, you know, already we, we, we heard from Rolf also in the DSSI, the Debt Suspension Initiative. Um, you know, um, all of these things go in the right direction. And I think they've mitigated, you know, the severity of the shock. I think the problem is that as the shock persists, our toolkit begins to become more limited. You know, that uh, how much more borrowing from the multilaterals can take place and be absorbed by countries that are already facing debt difficulties. Um, you know, the DSSI initiative has had its high points and its low points. Its high points have been that it did do, you know, what it set out to do, that it provided the ability to reorient interest payments into other things to some degree, but not to the degree that, that, that we hoped at the World Bank. We, we had expected more private sector participation in this, which has yet to happen. Um, so I, I think one thing that multilaterals can help do in sort of as we look forward is for those countries that are either already in debt distress or will be soon, um, moving to help foster more ha rapid restructuring, too. more rapid write-offs uh, and restructurings of debt. Because um, on average, in the work that I've done with Christoph Trevish from the Kiel Institute uh, and Josephine Meyer, you look at uh, the 200-year history of restructurings and the average 
depending whether you look at post-war, the whole period, is upward of seven years. You know, uh, it's a long road. And, and, and I think it's, the, it's a big challenge for governments. Uh, we can talk more about that, you know, for governments, but, uh, big, big financial centers, for the multilaterals and the private sector to, to make those restructurings more expedient so that we don't have more lost decades. Thanks, Carmen. I actually want to bring a question in from the audience on this. And Rolf, I'm going to turn to you uh, for this question. So if you would unmute yourself, I'll come to you. Um, and it's a question about democracy. It's a question about governance. And I know that the BTI takes into account these indicators as well. But I wonder if you can talk a bit about the impact of governance uh, in the policymaking choices that, uh, that countries are making when it comes to the economic situation they find themselves in, what the knock-on effect is for the people in those countries um, we were already in a very volatile environment when it comes to democracy, whether you look at the BTI or you open a newspaper, it was already volatile. What do you imagine it's going to look like going forward as a result of the, the COVID crisis, both economically and politically? Well, I'm not a political scientist, so that is, of course, something for Hauke is much more uh, experienced and qualified to do, to say something about that. But let me turn to the question of democracy threatened by the, the crisis. From an economic point of view, what is really relevant is uh, stabilization and, uh, and, um, and trust in governance systems. You know, I come from a country which is supposed to run fairly smoothly through the crisis so far. And that has made, and of course, there is some truth behind it. The reason is that, for instance, my country, Germany, has a very strong safety, social safety net and an ongoing dialogue between the governance and the electorate and the government and the electorate over many, many years. So the system is well established and people keep quiet and as long as uh, their situation seems to be under control. And that is very important. Uh, so many countries who have these stable safety conditions uh, sailed quite smoothly through a number of crises, also through the 2008 crisis. Uh, that depends, of course, basically on what we did in the past, not only economically with respect to sound financing and, um, and exploiting their economic potential, but also socially trying, of course, to mitigate uh, social tensions between various groups through party systems and so on. And in this respect, some countries did well in this respect. I think Germany is a case in, in positive case. While other countries where these populist uh, governments try to split uh, the electorate into two groups, the enemies and the friends, the split of the societies, of course, has done a lot of harm, especially with respect to the chances of to recover from such a crisis, because you know, of course, you need the potential of all the talents and uh, the the, the possibilities of the people. And if you split a country into the groups, uh, you face a number of uh, deadweight losses and tensions and collateral damages, which of course are very, very bad for the recovery. In this respect, of course, you can't change a, a society over the night and over a crisis. But of course, it can help to avoid any further splits of societies into two friends and enemies. And that is what populist governments do. And this is why populist governments will not be so safe in recovering from the crisis than the other democracies. Thank you. For not being a political scientist, you answered that question <laughs> extremely well. But Halka, he invoked your name on this. So I wonder if you'd like to chime in on this topic as well. With pleasure, thank you. Yes, there's really not so much to add. Um, when we look at the last decade, um, we see a continuing decline of the quality of democracy um, on global average in many developing uh, and transformation countries, uh, especially in those regions which were democratically most advanced, Latin America, East Central, Southeastern Europe, parts of so Southern Africa. Um, what happened, among other things, was an erosion of rule of law an erosion of the separation of powers, meaning that the executive gained more and more power over the years um, for very um, uh, clientelist reasons. Uh, now, the pandem pandemic um, threatens to accelerate this trend because in a time of a health crisis, in time of a social and an economic crisis, 
there's an urge to increase safety and the executive is the part of the government system that promises the safety and that can instrumentalize the crisis in order to strengthen its position even further. That's the bad news. Um, when I start off with the governance, um, I can come back to what Rolf already mentioned, that it very much depends not so much on the political system, but more on the political legitimacy. Uh, we have seen quite effective um, uh, crisis management, let's say, in places like Vietnam or China um, uh, or other places, but also in South Korea. Or Taiwan or I trust that people endow in a government uh, than in uh, the actual political system that they're having. But of course, uh, at a time where the legitimacy of a government by the economic and social consequences it looks like we're having some trouble with halka's signals so um, and uh, autocratic uh, might be might be in the offing uh, so um uh, all in all i would say uh, last point uh, that um uh, there is a chance that at least we see a, a popular mood swing as far as populist regimes are concerned, because the governments, as Rolf already pointed out, that performed extremely negatively were Indonesia, Philippines, Brazil, and out of, out of the BTI, but still there, USA, uh, UK. Uh, those were countries uh, in which populism reigned in order to not trust the scientists, in order to aggrandize the leading people further. And uh, this has been signified by really bad crisis management. Okay, thank you. We were having a little trouble with your signal about halfway through there, but it looks like you're back with us. So thank you. Okay, okay. Thanks Sorry. for staying with us there. No, no, not at all. Uh, Carmen, I want to pick up on, on one of the points that Halka made, and it's, it's about legitimacy, and it, it also brings in one of the questions from the audience. Uh, when countries are in trouble, um, they do realize at the end of the day, there's no such thing as free money. Um, but yet they may look to the IMF and World Bank, they may look to sources like China for additional assistance. I wonder if you can talk about the balance that needs to be struck in countries that are in trouble, looking at the long-term prospects for themselves. Where should they be turning? Um, can they have confidence in international institutions? Um, I wonder if you can speak to that issue. So um, I think it's been very clear that in the midst of, of this crisis, uh, IMF, World Bank lending, you know, the number of countries over 100. Uh, this is, you know, the, so clearly I think countries turn for emergency financing at a time of need to, to the multilaterals um, and, and the multilaterals have, have fulfilled that role. I would still say that um, we are still in the stage where the crisis is raging you look at COVID, uh, um, you know, new COVID cases in India, they're soaring. Uh, in Indonesia and the Philippines, for that matter, two countries that were mentioned. Um, and so the, 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 the crisis is still very much on. I think the usual tensions with the multilaterals will begin when the dust begins to settle and it becomes more evident that, uh, you know, an, an IMF program, a World Bank program will require, you know, adjustment will require um, structural changes that have in the past been difficult to implement. So I, I don't think we're at the stage yet where that tension has arisen, but I think we're going there. And, and that gives um, me, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, please continue. Uh, no, one, one more thing on China. Um, 
you know, so, so countries like, like Sri Lanka, like Laos have been very uh, dependent. And this is another line of work I've done uh, with Christoph Trevish and Sebastian Horn from the Kiel Institute. Um, you know, uh, overseas lending by China soared, soared in the last two decades, and a lot of it going to commodity producers that are low income and that are some of the very countries that are in distress. Um, and um, the approach with China thus far uh, has been um, to uh, extend maturities, um, and to uh, use up collateral, you know the the you know these are collateralized debts. A good bit of these debts are collateralized. Um, so, in terms of actual steps signaling that more new funding or debt forgiveness is in the pipeline, uh, we haven't seen that yet. So, so, you know, there is the question of whether these countries uh, will still uh, feel that they, you know, their, the future of their finance um, is, is, is with China. Um, no doubt many will, uh, but, but I think the boom, real boom, in lending from China to the developing world is behind us and not in front of us. Thanks, Carmen. And, and I wanted to pick up on a point you mentioned about the dust settling. Um, there was a question that we had from the audience of, of when that might happen. You know, when are we actually going to see the impact, the full impact of the economic, uh, the economic calamity that may have come from the corona crisis? When's that likely to come? I don't know. I mean, it's it's a it's it, this is a re, it's a really big question because I, th there are you know I spoke and we have all spoken to this different degrees of vulnerability you know so how close you are to uh, you know the distance to a crisis is 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 very different across countries uh, so you know for some when we will we see full effects. For some, we're already seeing, you know, we, we have countries in distress already um, and more joining that list, you know, with, with very dire. So we, we, not to say that that's the full impact, but we've seen a good brunt of it. Others that have, been, you know, had more tools at their disposal, um, you know, the, the, the critical question, as I see it, depends, and this is not a cop-out on answering the question at all, it's, it's on the disease. You know, it's, it's not over on the disease, it's not over on the balance sheet. Uh, you know, if you, I mean, we're seeing a resurgence in France, in Spain. Uh, you know, uh, if, if we don't have a vaccine yet, I don't know what next winter will look like. And so, um, you know, I, I Again, this was 100 years ago, but if you read about the influenza, the Spanish influenza, it began in the United States in Kansas in March in 1918, and it circled the globe for two years. It was, and in, in, in 1920, it was still killing millions in, in India. And so, uh, you know, uh, I think the takeaway you know, the sober takeaway is without, you know, melodrama of, of, of another major wave or anything, it will, you know, uh, I think the negative effects of the shutdown, the negative effects on balance sheets, on bankruptcies, and, and at, at the household, corporate, and sovereign level will still play out uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't think you hit that turning point really quickly. You know, things, it, it, is, it is harder to build than it is to destroy. Um, you know, if you look at, this is a, my last comment on this, but if you look at the path of global poverty, 
it had been a very gradual decline. It was more rapid, you know, up till about five years ago. And then it began to, you know, post 2015 and began to slow down. Uh, but the spike this year is, it, so it's, you know, slow to, slower to improve, but quick to, to, to reverse. Thanks, Carmen. Rolf, I see you sitting forward on that. Did you want to chime in on the same, on the same topic? Well, that is, of course, as uh, Carmen said, almost impossible to say. <clears throat> uh, the stock exchanges are overly optimistic so far. And I do not see that there is uh, sufficient, uh, let's say, background to such optimism. Second, of course, this is not a crisis which started at a specific date. We had the 15th September 2008 crisis. We had the 2nd July 1997 with the Southeast Asian crisis. This crisis began gradually, and it will end gradually, very slowly. Maybe what we see afterwards, hey, yes, now the, we can say the crisis has been mastered. And as long as we don't have the vaccine, I don't see, of course, a recovery, especially in the confidence of investors and consumers. Investors will wait for, let's say, sentiments. The sentiments, purchase manager indexes, are quite optimistic at the moment, but they start, of course, from a lower level. And of course, if uh, the rising tide lifts all boats, that means everybody believes in good news, but these good news are not sustainable, and they are probably not stable. In this respect, I share this, um, let's say, well, skeptical view of Carmen, that the worst is already behind us. We do not know what happens in winter. Indoor activities will come up and indoor activities are good for inf infection activities. And uh, people will, of course, be remain very cautious, not only because of the lack of vaccine, but also because of the fear of their jobs. And that will, of course, also hold in, in many countries, um, not only in the, in the developing countries, but also, of course, in the developed world. And, of course, we have these political tensions which circle around the world. Now in Europe, with respect to Germany and Russia and Belarus, we have still this pending issue. I think this is also one of these questions which come up uh, on the trade policy conflict between China and the US. Of course, it's now at low profile, two months ahead of the elections, but it is still on the agenda. It's still there, it's not settled. And if it is really uh, fulfilled this agreement, then as I said before, it will be at the expense of many developing countries. Uh, of course, uh, there will be some sort of trade aversion, managed trade, which is not all good for innovation. So. Uh, we have, of course, the crisis plus all the political tensions. And uh, at the moment, I feel even perhaps more on the political tensions because it can uh, create uh, overshooting activities and which are all bad for restoring the confidence of investors and consumers. Thanks, Ralph. Halk, I want to come to you on that point. Um, Ralph raised the issue of the US-China rivalry. <laughs> Uh, and, and existing tensions at the moment. And it's a question that's come up from the audience as well. I wonder if you could speak to, you know, looking at the BTI results, uh, what impact does the US-China tension have on the, the results in Asia, in other parts of the world? Do you see any connection between peaks in, in tension between the US and China and valleys and any knock-on effect there? Actually, I hesitate to answer that question because I think this plays directly in the field of expertise of, uh, uh, of the other two panelists. I know that Wolf can say uh, really a lot to that. Um, if I may pick up a point that was mentioned earlier, which I would rather like to dig a little bit deeper into is what Carmen mentioned regarding um, the, um, the decrease in poverty levels that slowed down during the last five years um, and that now is expected to rise again uh, due to um, uh, due to the um, uh, fallout of the pandemic. And uh, the reason why this intrigues me so much is first of all, because what we have seen uh, uh, is that uh, yes, um, absolute poverty in terms of really being very, very poor and not knowing what to eat the next day. Uh, those are poverty levels that actually uh, were reduced substantially. Uh, but relative poverty, um, 
and some countries due to an increasing social divide has even risen during the last couple of years. Now, when we are looking at, at a couple of countries that have established, uh, we once thought stable democracy, or at least are striving to establish a democratic regime. And at the same time, you're seeing very rapidly rising levels of poverty and an increase in social inequality. Um, then we need to look at Brazil, for example, that lifted hundreds of um, um, uh, tens, tens of millions out of, of, out of poverty during um, uh, the Lula and Rousseff administrations, uh, only to see them now sliding back into poverty even before Corona, and now this being intensified. And then you have the likes of Bolsonaro who are, who are running countries. So this is a development that I see specifically dangerous for democratic development. Um, as far as Russia and, and uh, as far as China and the US are concerned, I'm, I'm backing that question. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I'll, I'll drop it then in, in Rolf's lap since you suggested that he's got some, some <laughs> thoughts on it. And Carmen, if you'd like to chime in after that on this, on this question as well, that would be great. Go ahead, Rolf. Well, again, um, the combination of political tensions and uh, the crisis, of course, is not a good starting point for an early recovery. This is uh, quite clear. Uh, another point, of course, is uh, whether developing some developing countries can, uh, let's say, rely on what I call the big brother. Of course, some countries like Mexico had that over the, the 1994 uh, crisis. Again, um, bilateral support, in addition to multilateral support, would be very helpful in this respect. Um, and here, of course, some countries um, share a specific, uh, let's say, responsibility for, for other areas, of course, to which we are strongly linked. Uh, that has to do with uh, the uh, African countries linked to Europe through trade agreements. That could be done more, of course, with respect to support for survival in the deepest crisis. But, of course, what I also want to stress is that we transition from support for survival to support for development that, of course, must not be forgotten. Uh, we are now in a situation where we see we help countries fighting for survival. Uh, that must end at a specific moment. And we should not, of course, forget about the long-term uh, targets of development cooperation, which, of course, is not confined to survival aid, but to development aid. Thank you. Sorry, Carmen. I, now I'm muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll, we'll all get one in today. Uh, Carmen, did you want to add to that? So, so yes, I, I, I do. Um, you know, I, in the context of the U.S. and uh, China trade frictions, I, it's very also connected to the dis prior discussion on governance and populism and so on. Um, I'd like to couch it also in terms of big cycles. You know, I'm a big fan of history. And uh, in, in, in my work with Ken Rogoff in, in, in our book, we talked about long cycles of globalization, okay? Um, the first globalization peak that we identified was just before World War I, and then came World War I, the Depression, World War II, Bretton Woods with capital controls and, you know, this time around, the peak was just before the 2008-2009 crisis. Uh, you know, the fact that current account deficits in Greece and Ireland and Spain had to be shrunken very quickly meant, you know, this was a blow to trade. Then we had, you know, uh, uh, Brexit. We've had the Trump-China still ongoing trade war. And now we have COVID with the, the global supply shocks also that Rolf uh, was talking about. Um, so, you know, and it's also what I'm concerned in, and this is in connection to the discussion both uh, Hauke and Rolf have had is, you know, populism tends to gain ground in bad times you know, when, when things are rough. 
And that in many regions and over you know, many episodes through history has been characterized by backtracking and back paddling um, and more closed economy, uh, more inward looking uh, strategies. And, and that is a concern. Uh, that is a concern. But I have to say, I, I have to throw this in because Rolf set me up for it. But when he talked about the, this, this con the, the incongruence between the equity market and the real side of the economy, one is going like this, the other one's going like this. Uh, I have to say, it, it's not just, it, maybe I'm a little cynical, but I don't think so. You know, it, it's not just about optimism, it's about guarantees. <laughs> you, you know, that, that, that we have central banks buying corporate debt right, left and center, uh, large, you know, large interventions are going to be made to support corporates that would have otherwise failed. Uh, so, so, you know, bear that in mind. It's not just, you know, it, it's, I think that's, that helps understand the disconnect, which is very relevant to the discussion we've been having about the economic outlook. And, and what I'm saying is that the market behavior isn't necessarily the indicative indicator it might have once been. We've got about five minutes remaining. I want to come back to, to you and Rolf on one final question. And then Halka, I've got some, a parting remark for you as well. So you're not going to let you off that easy. Um, Carmen, you, you mentioned, you referenced your book, uh, This Time is Different. And I've seen people in lots of interviews ask you whether this time is different. I'm not going to ask you that. Um, it, you it's, can. I'm not going to. I'm going to do something different this time. <laughs> it, it suggests to me that, that we keep doing things over and over again, right? And so I wonder if if next time is gonna be different, right? Are we learning anything from what's happening right now? And if so, what, what should we be taking away from this experience? So let me start with it this time. It is different. I, 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 I highlighted the point, you know, that, you know, that, that this time is different syndrome always usually starts in, you know, during the boom, which we're still seeing that in the equity market. Uh, during the boom, you know, everyone's a genius, you know, we're, we're, this is going to last forever. And that sets up the stage for the bust. This time the bust came because of a pandemic. Not necessarily because everyone was in this pre-pandemic credit fuel boom, you know, with bubbly asset prices and Although we had elements of that, certainly, but but it 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 is you know, I think where the this time is different uh, syndrome kicks in uh, at the moment is you know human nature it, and the this time is different syndrome is all about human nature. It, human nature, you know, is uh, you know good times, good shocks last forever, and bad times are temporary. I guess it's a coping device. And, and, and right now, again, I think uh, we may be uh, underestimating, uh, significantly underestimating uh, the, what it will take to recover. Um, and, and so, <laughs> you know, uh, I think where the takeaway on, on do we learn, I'm not so optimistic. You know, I mean, there's certain things, obviously, that we've learned from the past, you know, that, that I, 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 I hope I highlighted sufficiently that a huge, huge difference between the coping with the global turndown in the 30s and today it was the, the policy response, you know, truly being, you know, aimed at counter cyclicality, at, at cushioning the downturn. Um, that's, but... I think, you know, there is still, uh, you know, much to be learned uh, about uh, declaring premature victory on a lot of things. You know, um, in the 1990s, we had the great moderation, right? We had tamed the business cycle. We, you know, uh, we had, uh, you know, really 
didn't have to worry about volatility. Uh, we know how that has worked out. Um, we, if, if in 2006, we would have had a conversation that an advanced economy in Europe would actually have a sovereign default, nobody would have believed us. Um, now it's, you know, we're very uh, complacent that inflation's dead, you know, that, you know, the, the underweighing the importance of debt, um, it, all those things are this time is different. Uh, and I, I don't think so. I, you know, I mean, as, as it's often said, the opera ain't, ain't over till the fat lady sings. Um, and uh, this opera ain't over. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carmen. R Rolf, to you, any, any takeaways that we should be thinking about before we go? Well, in one sentence, um, the state sector will come back. So we will see stronger states. This is the hour, uh, this is the period, the era of states and they are partisans and these are the central banks. So what I see is that we will have much more importance of the public sector, we have much more importance for the state as a whole, as a driver and the seat. And of course, as a market economist, I'm not overly happy with, with say an excessive uh, state action in the, way, in the economy that can, too much of a good thing. We need the states, but my fear and my concern is that the state will do more than is necessary to overcome the crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Rolf. And Halka, I want to end with you. Um, I'm going to give you the impossible task of looking into your crystal ball <laughs> at BTI 2022. Um, tell me, what is the world going to look like in 2022? Yeah, no, that's, then let's have a good look. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Democracy quality is going to decline, uh, but not not drastically, uh, only moderately so, because right now um, um, we can rather see that there are infringements on democratic quality by default rather than by strategy. Um, uh, there are a lot of infringements on freedom of movement, demonstration, speech, and so on, uh, that are there for crisis management, but that of course are nonetheless uh, not democratically passed, not passed by parliament, um, uh, uh, not on a temporary basis, um, uh, not well justified and so on. So there will be a small decline in democracy quality. There will be a grave decline in economic quality, especially in the level of socioeconomic development, uh, in fiscal stability and in economic performance. And there will be um, hardly no change in the governance quality because those governments that had been performing, performing well before for the crisis in all likelihood will continue to be performing well and all those that had failed their populations before will continue to do so unfortunately well on that sunny on that sunny note okay <laughs> thank you for that um, it seems like we ended the way we began but uh, I, I just wanted to start by thanking carmen reinhardt Ralph Langhammer, Halka Hartman, thank you all so much for being with us and for sharing your expertise and your time. Um, we've kept everybody into overtime and I appreciate the audience sticking with us. The final session in this series will be coming two weeks from today, on um, the 23rd of September, where we'll be focused on the Middle East. So I hope you all will come back and join us for that. In the meantime, again, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to the audience. I wish all of you a very pleasant and safe day. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.